This video is brought to you by Rocket Money. Stick around to hear more about the special offer they're providing to the entire upper echelon community. All right, today is a little bit different compared to, I guess, typical channel content, but for some reason I find myself particularly interested in the subject matter and wanted to post a sort of discussion, if you will. Full disclosure, I'll be making a conscious effort not to fall too far down the conspiracy rabbit hole, but simultaneously, everyone saw the title already, so no need to avoid it there, this video will grapple with the idea that lines between conspiracy and reality have become somewhat blurred as of late. Again, some people might instinctively recoil at the thought of that discussion on its face, owing to their lockstep adherence to whatever it is the current authority has told them to think, decrying anyone who speaks up against that as conspiracy-driven or paranoid, but given the state of the modern world, I think it's a well-placed topic that has a great deal of relevant subject matter. Here's the premise. Lines between conspiracy, or more likely what is labeled as conspiracy by an authoritative voice, and reality have become increasingly hard to identify or define. And with that comes a significant loss of trust, spiraling instability, as well as a number of additional risk factors in tow, as a significant group of the wider population begins to lose faith in, quote unquote, experts, institutions, and government. It's not everyone, and it's certainly not every single contemporary issue right now, but with a growing list of highly scrutinized but somehow nebulous current and past events, trust is becoming less and less common, while conspiracy theories are continuing to gain traction. So what's the point of the video? The main objective here is to challenge existing mainstream beliefs in a healthy way, without overindulging, I guess, while simultaneously highlighting a reality where we simply cannot believe scientific or governmental statements of fact with blind adherence. To be clear, I do not advocate that we simply disregard everything we hear from established institutions or governmental bodies. That would be a complete disaster in its own right. But the idea that established power structures are always preserving and protecting our best interests is laughably naive. In reality, power protects power, and what we are told on any given day has absolutely no intrinsic correlation whatsoever with the truth. Maybe it is the truth, that particular time, but the idea that governing powers are here to actually protect us or convey the God's honest truth is laughable. And today, I'd like to discuss just how blurred the lines between conspiracy and reality have now become. Alright, before going further, it's time for today's video sponsor, which is Rocket Money. Formerly known as Truebill, Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. More specifically, the personal finance manager allows you to manage subscriptions, lower bills, monitor your credit score, and build up your savings all in one place. As a personal anecdote here, I consider myself pretty good at managing my finances, seeing all of your subscriptions laid out bare in one single place like that is a great motivator to make changes and be much more cost effective. I've started to cancel a number of streaming services, for example, and help lower my monthly bills as a result. On top of that, I can monitor my credit score and set budgets by category to help with certain frivolous spending habits, we'll call them, where small charges add up and make a pretty big impact. Adding this in after the initial ad read as a side note, Rocket Money will actually help you negotiate bills. Simply upload a photo of your bill and authorize them to do so, and they will renegotiate your payments from cable to internet service and even phone bills. To save more and spend less, you can join 3.4 million existing members who use Rocket Money right now today. Of course, it's a sponsorship, so I do have a special connection. If you go to rocketmoney.com UEG or click the link down below in the description, you can get started for free right now or unlock even more features with a premium subscription. Again, rocketmoney.com UEG to get started for free, link down below in the description. Big thank you to Rocket Money for sponsoring the channel. All right, let's begin with a series of examples. First things first, the United States government has a long history of clandestine activities and conspiracy-grade projects. There's no shortage of adequate options here to choose from, let me assure you, but for the sake of time, I'll focus on some of the more notable or impactful examples that showcase precisely how extreme things can actually get. How many people watching this right now have ever heard of bad booze? Answer? Probably not very many, and I don't just mean in a literal sense where booze are bad, because this particular conspiracy theory, proven true, by the way, did not ascend to national news coverage or catapult itself into mainstream consciousness, despite being one of the most alarming examples of conspiratorial activity in American history. During Prohibition, bootleggers resorted to a wide range of different techniques in order to create illegal alcohol. Some of those tactics involved stills and fermentation, classically speaking, but others involved the usage of industrial-grade alcohol as well. In their efforts to combat a thriving underground world of illegal alcohol consumption, a battle that they were very clearly losing at the time, the United States government decided to try some new tactics. 
Industrial alcohol manufacturers, alcohol that was often referred to as non-beverage alcohol, which includes examples like rubbing alcohol for medical purposes, had been inserting chemical compounds for decades already, dangerous chemical compounds. But from 1926 to 1933, the federal government strongly pushed these manufacturers actively to increase the amount and efficacy of dangerous chemicals that they included in their traditional goods. This policy was designed to hurt moonshiner business by turning the product they created into poison, and it worked. Over the course of a few years, upwards of 10,000 American lives were actually lost as the government strong-armed industrial alcohol manufacturers into poisoning their own product as a way of controlling the American people, especially those who were defying a governmental order that alcohol should be forbidden. AKA, the government poisoned their own people. A small number of concerned citizens began to fight back against this practice. They were subsequently branded as conspiracy theorists, but eventually, as is now true for a great many shocking scandals, they were vindicated. The truth came out, supporting practically everything that the conspiracy theorists had said and disproving everything that the mainstream narrative had pretended, showcasing that the people on the fringe with radical warnings and passionate ideals might not actually be unhinged or crazy, at least not all the time. How about another example? MK Ultra. This one in particular is far more high profile, but how could I ever discuss the topic of conspiracies without mentioning it? MK Ultra, in its purest form, was a clandestine operation created to test whether or not specific drugs and brainwashing tactics could be used to control minds. The experiments were run at various universities, inside select prisons, and often conducted on unaware US citizens. Without mincing words here, this was psychological torture, conducted on Americans by their own government, taking place over the span of 20 years. These experiments were eventually exposed in 1975 during a broader inquiry about widespread crimes by the CIA. But to this very day, many of us remain blissfully unaware that our own government agencies were secretly conducting over 150 human experiments with shock therapy, forced psychedelic drug usage, even paralytics, and many of the subjects were tricked or even forced into these experiments against their will. MK Ultra is one of the most shocking examples we currently have, but again, there's plenty more. What about Project Sunshine? For some, it's just a name, but for anyone familiar with the backstory, it's a horror show. After the initial invention of atomic weapons, during the 1950s in particular, the United States government conducted a series of radioactivity tests. Now, for some, that may seem normal or fine, but what wasn't normal was how they decided to go about gathering data. Over the course of many years, and only discovered or investigated properly some five decades later, the US government was stealing cadavers, deceased bodies, mainly of infants, in order to conduct strontium absorption tests. These cadavers were stolen, or even pieces of them were stolen, and I do mean that quite literally, without parental consent, without general knowledge by the public, and even worse, they were taken by a global network of agents trained to operate in the shadows and steal body parts of young deceased subjects without getting caught. Our own government has verifiably encouraged the poisoning of its own citizens, subjected them to secret mind-controlled drug experiments, and created a global network of body snatchers, all to conduct illegal medical research or flat-out control the population. And yet, somehow, we sit here on social media, some of us, pretending that the science is to be trusted without question, obeyed without dissent, and supported without reason. Here's the thing. Conspiracy theories are often proven true, it just takes a tremendous amount of time. Take Jeffrey Epstein, for example. Epstein ran a criminal enterprise of near biblical proportions. His little black book has over 1,000 names, numbers, even addresses for major political players, celebrities, presidents, and titans of industry. We now know that he managed a vast ring of criminal activities, and yet, after dying mysteriously in prison, not one of those contacts has ever been arrested. We the people are fully aware now of a massive sexual predation ring that infiltrated the highest levels of government and culture, and yet nothing happened. No cascading arrests, no further action taken as a result of gathered records, victim testimony led nowhere, practically, and what should have been one of the cleanest and most high-profile takedowns in history became a simple prison death. Nothing more, nothing less. Not too long ago, everyone calling out Sam Bankman-Fried, the now famous fraudster at the helm of FTX and Alameda Research, was called a conspiracy theorist. But now? Now he is one of the largest political donors in history, being brought up on campaign finance fraud charges, among many other criminal charges, after doing God only knows what with billions of customer dollars. The problem is this. Conspiracy theories are born and thrive in the absence of reliable information. Before and during COVID, for example, we were being told that everyone who speculated on the possibility of the virus leaking from a lab was spouting mindless and baseless conspiracy theories. But now, 
Now we are learning that the country's most renowned, and some would say hated, doctor was deliberately avoiding acknowledgement of the lab leak theory, specifically because he didn't want to say anything at the time against China, not because of truth or fact. According to extensive deposition testimony from Fauci himself, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the theory was deliberately ignored. And yet now, as the dust settles and the process of investigating pandemic origins has become exponentially more difficult, now he's open to all theories. Now it's acceptable to discuss things. In addition, Dr. Anthony Fauci consistently stated, in front of Congress no less under oath, that there has not been, at any point, gain-of-function research funded by the NIH in Wuhan. Flash forward, documents have emerged, courtesy of The Intercept, that at the very least cast significant doubt upon that assertion, with emerging scrutiny on whether or not the hours and hours of congressional sworn oath testimony are even true. We're still in the early stages, the very early stages. A lot of what happens behind the scenes takes years, even decades, to be exposed. For example, they are still declassifying documents on the assassination of JFK. But in the meantime, I'd like to play a clip from CIA officer Frank Snepp. The clip is decently long, over four minutes in fact, and originally went mainstream as a result of coverage by Edward Snowden. But for today, I think it's particularly relevant. You briefed the press, did you not, when you were there? Well, I had several jobs. One of my jobs was that of analyst. Uh, I also was an interrogator and indeed briefed the press when we, the CIA, wanted to um, circulate disinformation on a particular issue. Disinformation is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily a lie. It may be a half-truth. And uh, we would pick out a journalist. I would go do the briefing and uh, hope that he would put the information in print. For instance, if we wanted to get uh, across to the American public that the North Vietnamese were building up their force structure in South Vietnam, I would go to a journalist and advise him that in the past uh, six months, X number of North Vietnamese forces had come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail system through southern Laos. Now, there is no way a journalist can check that information. So either he goes with the information or he doesn't, and ordinarily or usually the journalist would go with it because it, was, it looked like some kind of exclusive. And um, I would say our percentage of planning that kind of data was uh, 70 to 80 percent. The correspondents we targeted were those who had terrific influence, the most uh, respected journalists in Saigon, like Robert Chaplin of the New Yorker magazine, Kai's Beach uh, of the Los Angeles Times from time to time, and also he worked for the Chicago Daily News, uh, Bud Merrick of U.S. News and World Report, uh, Malcolm Brown of the New York Times, and even Maynard Parker of Newsweek magazine. Uh, we would uh, go after these gentlemen. Uh, I would uh, be directed to cultivate them, to spend time with them at uh, the Caravelle Hotel or the Continental Hotel, to socialize with them, and, and slowly but surely to try to gain their confidence by dolloping out uh, valid information, information which was true. And then I would drop in a, into a conversation the data that we wanted to get across which might not be true. Uh, one piece of data, for instance, uh, that uh, we managed to plan in the New Yorker magazine had to do with uh, a supposed North Vietnamese effort in 1973 to develop airfields along the border of South Vietnam. The reason we wanted to plant this information was that uh, we were trying to persuade the U.S. Congress that Saigon should uh, be continued to, uh, should continue to get a great deal of aid. Uh, and that uh, the North Vietnamese were the chief violators of the ceasefire accord. That was printed in uh, uh, the New Yorker magazine under the byline of Robert Chaplin, as indeed was a great deal of such information which, uh, which we tried to circulate. If I planted a piece of information with a reporter, I would ordinarily then try to create an environment in which he could not check the information. I would go to the British ambassador and brief him on the disinformation I had just given the reporter. So when the reporter wanted to cross-check what I told him with, uh, say, the British ambassador, New Zealand ambassador, or what have you, he would get false confirmation, the same message coming back at him. He'd say, aha, I've got proof that Frank Snap told me the truth, when in fact what he'd gotten was simply an echo of what uh, I'd given him in the first place via the British ambassador or other of our friendly diplomatic contacts.
I am, as an XCI agent, uh, opposed to the disinformation activities uh, in which I was involved. I admit that I was involved, and I think it uh, uh, served no useful purpose. Uh, propagandizing the American uh, public or Congress is not the CIA's job. That testimony isn't unique or isolated. In 1978, former CIA Operations Director John Stockwell had a publicized interview and said this when asked very similar questions. There are other functions, however, some of them more legitimate than others. One is to run secret wars. Another thing is to disseminate propaganda to influence people's minds. And this is a major function of the CIA. And uh, unfortunately, of course, it overlaps into the gathering of information. You, you, you have contact with a journalist, you will give him true stories, you'll get information from him, you'll also give him false stories. You also work on their human vulnerabilities to recruit them in a classic sense, to make them your agent so that you can control what they do, so you don't have to set them up sort of, you know, by, by putting one over on them. So you can say, here, plant this one next Tuesday. Can you do this with responsible reporters? Yes, the Church Committee brought it out in 1975, and then Woodward and Bernstein put an article in Rolling Stone a couple of years later. Uh, 400 journalists cooperating with the CIA, uh, including some of the biggest names in the business, mm -hmm. to consciously introduce the stories into the press. Well, give me a concrete example of how you use the press this way. Well, for example, in my, my war, the Angola war that I helped to manage, uh, one third of my staff was propaganda. Uh, I had propagandists all over the world, principally in London, Kinshasa, and Zambia. We, were, we would take stories which we would write and put them in the Zambia Times and then pull them out and send them to a, a journalist on our payroll in Europe but his cover story, you see, would be that he, would, he had gotten them from his stringer in Lusaka, who had gotten them from the Zambia Times. But after that point, the journalists, uh, Reuters and AFP, uh, the management was not witting of it. Now, our contact man in Europe was, and we pumped l just, just dozens of stories about Cuban atrocities, Cuban rapists. But we didn't know of one single atrocity committed by the Cubans. It was pure, raw, false propaganda to to create a, an illusion of communists, you know, eating babies for breakfast. The number of indications are stacking up fast. Just this year, 2022 that is, the United States First Special Forces Command, specializing in psychological warfare, posted what can only be described as a recruitment video. This video is chilling, I'll link it down below, but even for people hell-bent on guzzling the very first version of whatever the government says to them, reality should be starting to dawn. There is a lag time at play here, where we don't find out the truth until years, possibly decades later. And right now? Right now we are experiencing extreme civil volatility, domestic and foreign policy struggles, as well as unprecedented levels of government control through medical mandates, lockdowns, or other legislative decisions, with no idea in the slightest what's true and what's not, or when we might actually learn more. A large number of people choose to simply believe everything they are told, because it comes from authoritative voices. But those voices lie to you. They have always lied to you. Not about everything, per se, every single time, but about select and important factors which radically change how you might react and redefine perceived reality to be more complacent, subdued, and controllable. The line between conspiracy and reality is becoming blurred. It's not blurred because of the imagined crackpot conspiracy theorists who are making things up too often. That's the party line. It's blurred because the people in power are using and abusing the principles of truth and honesty to cover their tracks in an unknown number of ways, while conspiracy theorists might go overboard at times, but very often see just enough of the real picture to take a guess at what it actually looks like, with a significant degree of accuracy here. Lately, it seems like the volatility of conspiracy theory discussion versus those that follow the science is increasing. But realistically, we need to ask ourselves, is it increasing because one side is just losing their grip on reality? Or is it because one side has always been this skeptical, since the dawn of humanity, we just now live in a world where the clandestine activities and secret agendas are more frequent, prolific, and closer to the surface, with a great deal more information on hand to disprove or investigate them? In my opinion, the answer is very obvious, but then... I am often called a conspiracy theorist for daring to believe that we aren't being told the whole truth, and that voices in power have a vested interest in stoking division. 
in the end, the lines have blurred and continue to do so, but all of us need to choose why we think that is on an individual level. Is it because the government turned over a brand new leaf? They now operate a truthful, medically scientific and honest enterprise where everything they say to you is true. What you see on the mainstream news is a fact and anyone doubting it should have their voices silenced for spouting conspiracy theories. Or is the opposite true, where the powers that be have begun to execute so many secret agendas that the same group of people who have always been skeptical and often write about that skepticism are now impossible to avoid because the instances that they can latch onto are so extreme and numerous. Every person needs to make up their own mind on this. Before winding down, one more thing, because that really is the end of what I wanted to get to. But yeah, one more thing. I want to also bring attention to a grant program from a company called FUTO. I was recently approached by another YouTuber I've gotten to know over the years named The Kino Corner, who is participating in a mission to help fund innovative and useful software that disrupts current tech oligopolies. The Fellows Program for FUTO is located in Austin, Texas, and will award up to $80,000 per project to innovative startups that have like-minded goals. Basically, it's a way to meet great people in a fast-growing field who are also dedicated to developing worthwhile software. On top of this, you'll be provided full housing right next to the FUTO offices, which are positioned directly in the heart of Austin, Texas, which has now emerged as a sort of Silicon Valley competitor, as well as an excellent space to network in the tech industry. There are three core tenets to understand here. One, your project must be open source. Reason being, tech monopolies own a disproportionate amount of our lives, and users deserve to have full knowledge of what your software is doing. Two, don't be evil. Don't make the customers the product by focusing on their data and selling it. Basically, be honest with your user base. And three, grants will not be given to projects that are exclusively designed to ramp up and sell out to a larger company. The program is meant to support creative developers with reputable goals. And for anyone interested, all the relevant information to apply is listed down below in the description with a link. To be clear, this video is not monetarily sponsored by FUTO. I have not been paid by them, not one single penny. I am including this because I tremendously respect their goals and want to raise awareness of a great fellows program. That's it. If you want to support the channel, please check out links down below, merch, social media, the video sponsor, of course, also locals and Patreon for monthly subscriptions, etc, etc. But I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching and have a nice night.